we acknowledge you as our King and as our Lord, the one who is sovereign over all things, the one who has made all things, the one who knows today and tomorrow, who knows every day to come. We acknowledge, Lord, that um, as we worship you this morning, there are many troubles. But we say, blessed be the name of the Lord. We don't understand what is going on around us each day, but blessed be the name of the Lord. We lose loved ones and we get bad diagnoses, but blessed be the name of the Lord. You have so provided. You are our great King. And Lord, we just pray that each day, in whatever way we can, we might glorify you. Because we know that all things work together for your glory. And it is our prayer this day that we would be a part of that. That we would execute that on your behalf. And the outcome would be that our great King would be glorified. Lord, we love you. We admit our need. We admit our brokenness. Our sin sometimes overwhelms us. But Lord, we repent. Our hearts are burdened with our sin. But you have made provision. And you have sent your great son on our behalf to bear that sin before you, to give us access to our home that you have prepared. Lord, we pray that you would bless us and be in our midst as we continue to worship in song. And as your word is open, Lord, may you wash over us this day that we might be changed. In Christ's name I pray. Amen.
Second Chronicles uh, this morning. It's probably one of the best known, probably the best known passage in Second Chronicles. But we'll begin reading at chapter 6, the 36th verse. Please pray with me and we will turn and read God's word. Father, we thank you for your word, which stands firm and that it endures. Heaven and earth will pass away, but your word will not pass away. And so it is with confidence that we read it, hear it, and receive it, and ask your blessing upon it, for the good of your people, for the glory of your name. Not only here, but throughout the world. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. amen. So this we pick up in Solomon's prayer of dedication in chapter 6. And so he prays, if they sin against you, for there is no one who does not sin. And you are angry with them and give them to an enemy so that they are carried away captive to a land far or near. Yet if they turn their heart in the land to which they've been carried captive and repent and plead with you in the land of their captivity, saying, We have sinned and have acted perversely and wickedly. If they repent with all their mind and with all their heart in the land of their captivity to which they were carried captive and pray toward their land, which you have to give, given to their fathers, the city that you have chosen and the house that I have built for your name, then hear from heaven your dwelling place their prayer and their pleas and maintain their cause and forgive your people who have sinned against you. Now, O oh my God, let your eyes be open and your ears attentive to the prayer of this place. And now arise, O Lord God, and go to your resting place, you and the ark of your might, let your priests, O Lord God, be clothed with salvation. Let your saints rejoice in your goodness. O Lord God, do not turn away the face of your anointed one. Remember your steadfast love for David, your servant. Picking up in the seventh chapter, verse 11. Thus Solomon finished the house of the Lord and the king's house. All that Solomon had planned to do in the house of the Lord and in his own house, he successfully accomplished. And then the Lord appeared to Solomon in the night and said to him, I have heard your prayer and have chosen this place for myself as a house of sacrifice. When I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain or command the locusts to devour the land or send pestilence among my people, if my people, who are called by my name, humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. I'm picking up at verse 19. But if you turn aside and forsake my statutes and my commandments that I have set before you and go and serve other gods and worship them, then I will pluck you up from the land that I have given you. And this house that I have consecrated for my name, I will cast out of my sight, and I will make it a proverb and a byword among all peoples. And at this house which was exalted, everyone passing by will be astonished and say, why has the Lord done this to this land and this house? And then they will say, because they abandoned, they abandoned the Lord, the God of their fathers, who brought them out of the land of Egypt, and they laid hold on other gods and worshipped them and served them. Therefore he has brought all this disaster on them. If, two letters, but it's a big word. You know, if I had purchased $1,000 worth of Apple stock in 1980, <laughs> On the anniversary date of 9-11, when we remember both the attack on our nation and, and how we drew together as a people at that time, we hear stories of men and women who tell, if I had not missed the subway on that day, if I had not been ill, if I had not got delayed in another meeting elsewhere, I would have been in my office in the World Trade Center on that day. If. Two letters, but it's a big word. And sometimes when the word if is used, the word actually meant is when. For instance, if I die. There's not an if on that, actually. 
In our passage this morning, the first half in chapter 6, verse 36, if they sin against you, and he says, for there is no one who does not sin, that if, if is actually a win. The same understanding is expressed in Romans 3, 23, isn't it? That all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And so Solomon continues in prayer, and you are angry with them and give them to an enemy so that they're carried away captive to a land far or near. And that's exactly what happened to them. And the chronicler is writing to those exiles who have now returned after 70 years in exile. Verses 37 to 39, that if they turn their heart and repent and plead with you, saying, we have sinned and acted perversely and wickedly, and if they repent with all their mind and with all their heart, then hear from heaven and forgive your people who have sinned against you. And so Solomon is praying, uh, and we need to understand what he's praying about. He's praying about the nation of Israel. He's praying about the people whom God has established in the promised land. And the temple has been built along with the palace and the promise of land and restoration to a particular land were being written about for a particular people at a particular time. And yet there's also a principle here based on the character of God that's for God's people in all places in all times. And that's what we're looking at here today to discern and to apply for ourselves. And particularly when we get to that most familiar part of the passage that's referred to so often in public gatherings. It's right to do that, but we need to understand what God is calling us to do, what God has promised to do for people to do today. So the first if has to do with recognizing and owning our sinfulness. Not just acknowledging sinfulness in general, not just noticing it in other people, but personal sin and national sin, that we recognize that. We'll come back to the focus on the second if in chapter 7, verse 11, but the third if begins in verse 19. But if you turn aside, so this is God's response. The, the first is Solomon's prayer in chapter 6. This is God's response. But if you turn aside and forsake my statutes and commandments that I've set before you and go and serve other gods and worship them, then I will pluck you from my land that I have given you. And this house that I have consecrated for my name, I will cast out of my sight. And I will make it a proverb and a byword among all peoples. They'll wonder. They'll ask, why did God do this to his people? Well, because he forsa they forsake him. They pursued other gods and worshipped them and served them. Ongoing rebellion. Ongoing ignoring of the Lord and his commands. Ongoing embracing and worship of other gods. Fame, celebrity, money, leisure, power, sex, recognition, and on and on. The worship of such, putting them in actuality above the priority of the Lord in our life, in daily life. Even if we don't say it with our words, it's by our actions. The people in the years after Solomon did all of that. Solomon did all of that. As we'll see in the next few weeks, the Lord was gracious and patient. He did not bring judgment immediately. Not on the first offense, not on the second offense, not on the third offense. The Lord was patient. After the death of King Solomon, the kingdom splits. And Judah is in the south, Israel is in the north, and the focus of the book of Chronicles is particularly in the southern kingdom of Judah. It has a string of kings, a mixture of good and evil kings, while Israel in the north has a string of evil kings, without exception. And they were the first to fall and be taken into exile by the Assyrians in 722 B.C. The southern kingdom would hang on until 586 B.C. But eventually they also, about 140 years later, go to captivity in Babylon. We see numerous 
calls that the Lord makes. And occasionally, good kings will heed it, and there will be a time of renewal, of repentance, of renewed obedience to the Lord and acknowledging the Lord as God. And God is gracious when His people repent and return to Him. The chronicler is writing to exiles who know that what these verses said actually happened. Because they're the ones returning from the exile. Verse 22, therefore he has brought all this disaster on them. Here we're reminded that even with calamity, God remains sovereign. Some people try to explain that away and get God off the hook for hard things. Well, if God could have done something about it, he would have. Oh, no. No, and I find no comfort in that kind of thinking that the bad things, the hard things, the challenging, sad things of life are beyond God's control. That God is just as helpless as we are. I take comfort in knowing that God is sovereign and God is good. Psalm 46.10 says, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. And that verse in Psalm 46 is in the context that declares God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in what? Trouble. In trouble. And then it describes in that psalm a life that's in turmoil and chaos. And the only shelter and security and hope is God. But beloved, that's no small consolation. God is the prize. God is always the prize. And God does not change. And so these returning exiles had to rebuild the temple. The former glory is clearly missing. And they've determined... And we'll have to determine again and again whether they will heed God's call and follow Him or whether they will rebel. The warning remains. And God doesn't change. I'll tell you, I love my country. And yet as a Christian, my citizenship, first of all, is in the kingdom of God. And that's true for all Christians. Heaven and earth will pass away. The USA will pass away. We may destroy ourselves. Growing up as a young child, my grandmother repeated often, and through my teen years, the words of Russia's communist leader, Nikita Khrushchev, who said, we will take America without firing a shot. We do not have to invade the U.S. We will destroy you from within. He was talking about the infiltration of communism. That's been something that has lingered throughout the years. We'll see if you recognize and see a commonality here. A chicken in every pot and a car in every garage. Peace and prosperity. The stakes are too high for you to stay at home. Not just peanuts. Are you better off than you were four years ago? Kinder, gentler nation. Don't stop thinking about tomorrow. Compassionate conservatism. Yes, we can. Make America great again. Build back better. They're all slogans. Each of them was part of an election that led to the president for our nation. None of them fully delivered on their promises. None. None of them really addressed the call to repentance and faith in God in full. And beloved, that's the heart and the root of America's problems today. Mostly, we treat symptoms. We do not address the core issues. And from listening, I don't think many even know the core issues. 
We hear things like keep God out of Congress, keep God in his place. And then two weeks ago, God wants you to be vaccinated by a politician. This passage does not say whether you get a jab or not. God's not speaking about that, that I've read. That is a choice you need to make. But if my people will just get vaccinated and I will hear from heaven and heal their land, that's not what he says. Because that's not the core problem. Beloved, that's not what's wrong with our country. It's not what's wrong with our world. The most well-known and referred to passage in 2 Chronicles is these verses here, in which God appears to Solomon at night, likely in the dream. He says, I've heard your prayer, and I've chosen this place, the temple for myself, as a house of sacrifice. When I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain, or command the locusts to devour the land, or send pestilence among my people, this refers to uh, verses 26 through 31 of chapter 6. We picked up reading after that today. Solomon prays that God will hear the prayers of repentance from his people and be gracious. And more than that, he prays that even a foreigner who is not of your people comes from a far country for the sake of your great name and your mighty hand and your outstretched arm. When he comes and prays toward this house, Hear from heaven. See, the design of the temple that's being dedicated in the prayer by Solomon included a court of the Gentiles. God's intention for Israel was to be a light to the nations about his sovereign goodness, about a forgiving God and a welcoming God and a holy God who calls us to become aware of and repentant of our sins. This is the big if. If my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and forgive their sin and heal their land. Readers of the time, following the return of the exiles from Babylonia, were looking to God to help them to restore and to heal the land. And God promised that the nation would receive relief from the hardship caused by their sin if the people would turn to him in humility and prayer. This has immediate relevance and application to these returning exiles. To come before the Lord humbly means to come with an attitude of remorse and total dependence on God. In the book of James, or his warning against worldliness, we read in chapter 4, verses 7 and 10, Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, and He will exalt you. God's answer to Solomon was in the form of a promise and a warning. What were the conditions upon which Solomon's petitions were to be granted? And do we fear the fulfillment of God's warnings? In the same way that we desire the fulfillment of his promises. Solomon prayed a glorious prayer. And he makes it on the basis of the mercy God extended to David. Don't miss that. It's not on the basis of their goodness. Oh Lord, look at how good we are. Not on the basis of their obedience or faithfulness or good intentions or their best efforts. Lord, we're doing our best. It's on the basis of the character and the promises of God which do not change. You and I are to pray to the Lord because Jesus Christ made a mercy seat. We saw the return of the Ark of the Covenant with a mercy seat last week. The mercy seat, the place of His shed blood. He made peace for us by the blood of His cross. And God is prepared to extend mercy through His Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Hallelujah. That is our hope. How are we to apply then these words of Solomon, particularly at heal their land? That was spoken regarding the temple and regarding the land of Judah. 
When we come to the New Testament, John the Baptizer says, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And the Lord Jesus repeated that. There are differences between the USA and the nation of Israel or Judah. So how do we apply this passage here and now? What are the, where, where are the applications? And there are applications. There's a formula here, my people. God is a people whom he calls by his name. The name Christian was first applied to followers of Jesus in Antioch, Acts 11. We are recognized by his name as his followers or his disciples. Titus 2.14, Jesus gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. If my people who are called by my name humble themselves. The flesh is proud, but we're admonished to be humble. Ephesians chapter 4, walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love. And pray, certainly many, many, many times in the New Testament we're admonished and encouraged to pray. The Lord Jesus told his disciples, watch and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. This all applies to us. God has much to say about repentance for believers. Repentance is not a one-time thing. It's a way of life. Revelation 3.19, Jesus says, Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline, so be zealous and repent. Repentance is for those who are called by Christ's name. So that's what we're to do. What is God's part? What does God promise? He promises that he would hear from heaven. And in the New Testament, 1 John 3, 22, and whatever we ask, we receive from Him because we keep His commandments and we do what pleases Him. But the thing is, we don't always keep His commandments and do what pleases Him. And so He also promised to forgive their sin. And again, in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. That is His promise. And this applies to us, just as it did in the time of Solomon and in the time of the chronicler writing to the returning exiles and in the time of the followers of Jesus in his earthly ministry and in the time of those under the ministry of the apostles in the first century, it applies to us as well. But what about this and heal their land? What does that mean to us? How do we apply that part? Because in the New Testament, there doesn't seem to be any particular reference to a land that's given. So what do we do with that? Certainly, the USA is not mentioned in the New Testament. But we do read this, Psalm 33, 12. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people who he has chosen as his heritage. And that statement of blessing was not just for the people of Israel. The gospel promise, the covenant promise to Abraham was that he would be a blessing to the nations. The design of the temple again included a court of the Gentiles, a welcoming place to draw the nations to hear the word of God, to repent of sin, and turn to the Lord, and he would hear their prayers. And that was the place, if you remember, that Jesus made the world. And he drove the money changers with all their livestock out of that area. It was the court of the Gentiles. It was the place that they were able to come and hear the word of God and pray. Well, they couldn't hear anything. And they couldn't think and they couldn't pray. And so Jesus restored order because the gospel message is for the world to hear. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. That's true to this day. Proverbs 14, 34, righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. Thomas Jefferson, the primary author of the Declaration of Independence, the third president of the United States, a strong advocate for straight states' rights, strong states' rights. And a man who was influenced by Christianity as well as deism, it's doubtful that he was a Christian. Nonetheless, he well understood and believed that God was real and that God was just. And so he said, indeed, 
I tremble for my country when I reflect that God is just. I tremble for my country, said Jefferson. This sentiment, this belief, this conviction was shared by the vast majority of the founders of these United States of America. False narratives to the contrary. They ignore the preponderance of the historical record while inflating certain aspects to create an entirely different narrative, one that ignores the bigger story. But the biggest story is this. Wherever there is sin, God's people are to humble themselves and pray and seek God's face. Not merely his hand, not merely, Lord, bless us, get this mess fixed so that we can continue just like we were, but seek his face. It's about relationship with God through his son, Jesus, that we would seek his face, that we would seek God on his terms, not on our terms, and turn from their wicked ways that we would repent. We're not to excuse sin or hide it or ignore it. We are to begin with ourselves. Jesus said, first take the log out of your own eye. And then you'll see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. The sins of our nation today are grievous. Abortion. Sexual exploitation. Human trafficking. Yeah, it's a problem in our country. Greed. The CDC just reported that our murder rate is the highest it's been in 100 years. Wherever racism, anti-Semitism, sexual harassment, and murder are ignored and sometimes celebrated. When we mortgage the future of our children and grandchildren, that's stealing. When parents are considered domestic terrorists for challenging school boards over what they're teaching to their children, that's fascism. The sins of our nation today are grievous. God's people are not to be defined by the sins of the nation or community where we abide. The very exiles that have returned to whom this passage is written were instructed by the prophet Jeremiah in that famous passage. It's often lifted out of context. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. That was spoken to exiles. They were in exile. Their future didn't look very bright. Far from ideal con conditions or situation. But just prior to that, the prophet Jeremiah tells them, Chapter 29. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. God says, I did it. Build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat their produce. Marry, multiply there, and do not decrease, but seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile, and pray to the Lord on its behalf. For in its welfare you will find your welfare. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel. And this part is important too. Do not let your prophets and your diviners who are among you deceive you. Do not listen to the dreams that they dream, for it is a lie that they are prophesying to you in my name. I did not send them, declares the Lord. It is followed by the promise that they will be restored to Israel after 70 years. The chronicler is writing to those restored. You see, from God's mouth to his hand, he accomplishes what he promises to do always in his time. And if my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. This is a big if. What will we do, church? What will you do, Christian, known by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ? 
this is the big end in our time. Let's pray. Oh Lord, we pray that you would awake your church, that you would stir your people here and throughout the world to first and foremost Seek your face. To repent of sin. To cry out to you, O oh Lord. And the problems of our nation are not first and foremost the world. And the problems of our world are not first and foremost the world. church, stir us to pray and repentance, and oh God, heal our land through the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ, we pray in his name. Fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest and abide with you, with those you love. And this is our nation for which we pray, even until Jesus comes again. Amen. Amen.